Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Astronomy on Tap in the Triangle. Uh, this is our last event for spring 2021. Uh, we're very excited to have you here, have uh, Dr. Greg Sloan with us. Uh, we're going to get started with his talk in just a few minutes, but uh, just to warm us up with the introduction, I would like to uh, give just a little bit of a brief talk. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So the topic for tonight is introducing the James Webb Telescope. And so to get us started, uh, I would like to go over just a few historical telescopes that have been uh, the long predecessors to JWST. So uh, one of the first uh, telescopes that NASA put in space uh, was, uh, or the first successful telescopes they put in space was the Orbiting Astronomical Observatory 2, which was nick nicknamed uh, Stargazer. This observatory had equipped uh, 11 ultraviolet telescopes, and it observed um, from 1968 to 1973. And it was really important for a lot of the first uh, UV observations of, of stars and galaxies. Another telescope was put up um, quite a long time ago was the Uhuru X-ray Observatory. This was the first um, telescope to survey the entire uh, X-ray sky. So it covered, it looked at every part of the night sky and detected as much X-ray emission as it could. And it's actually named um, Uhuru because that means freedom in Swahili. And that's named um, to, to thank the people of Kenya for uh, their hospitality and letting NASA launch uh, the satellite there. It observed for three years, 1970 to 1973. Another telescope was the Hipparchus telescope. It was an optical telescope. Um, Hipparchus was sort of an acronym. And if you've been to our talks before, you know astronomers love acronyms. So uh, Hipparchus is the High Precision Parallax Collecting Satellite. Uh, and the goal of this telescope was to actually map the night sky. So they observed more than 100,000 stars, galaxies, and tried to pinpoint their location precisely as well as understand their motion. Uh, so this was actually the precursor to what is now Gaia, which is um, kind of the standard in astronomy now for looking at the positions of stars, galaxies, pretty much every astronomical object. Now, a fourth telescope was called IRAS, so you get another astronomy acronym. This was uh, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. Uh, it was the sort of like the Uhuru telescope. Um, it was one of the first telescopes to do an all-sky survey, except this telescope did it in the infrared wavelength rather than X-ray. Uh, and unfortunately, it was only up for about uh, seven months, so February to November of 1983. Um, but even in that short amount of time, it discovered six new comets, which is pretty cool. And it actually led to uh, the discovery of stellar planetary disks. Um, so that paved the way for a lot of future research on that topic. Now, the jewel of tonight's talk is uh, the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, which uh, I believe is supposed to be scheduled to launch later this year, although uh, Dr. Sloan will have to tell you the details. So we're joined tonight by Dr. Greg Sloan. He is an adjunct professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as a support scientist um, at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, and there he works on the mid-infrared instrument for the James Webb Space, the James Webb Space Telescope. He received a BS in physics from Northwestern University and a PhD in physics and astronomy from the University of Wyoming. That was so long ago. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Greg and let him tell you about JWST. All right, let's get this talk fired up. And share my screen. So all these little technological hurdles. Bingo. And the trick here you said is I need to go into slideshow mode. All right, how's that look? Looks great, thanks. All right, excellent. So we're gonna introduce the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, and I see that my slideshow is taking off. We'll see if I can stop it. 
<laughs> anyway, so my title used to be support scientist, but uh, Space Telescope Science Institute decided that that was too easy to say. So now I'm the STSCI scientist at STSCI. And I'm the lead there for the calibration of MIRI. And I'm also the lead for what we call a coordination team for all the instruments that are working together to calibrate everything in unison. And here's a nice picture. This is an artist rendering of what uh, Webb would look like in space. Um, this is another artist rendering here of what Webb looks like in our imagination, at least. Uh, this was done by a couple of uh, other scientists, uh, David Law and Nora Lutzkendorf uh, have positions kind of like mine. Uh, David is on the uh, MIRI team and, and Nora is on another instrument team. And they did this really nice stained glass, which is hanging in the lobby of the Muller building where we all would be working if we were working at work. I haven't seen this hanging because uh, I haven't been there for a year now. And the little post-it here says remove before flight, which is sort of kind of a joke because you, know, you always have these tabs on things that you're supposed to take off before uh, you launch something. So the outline today is what I wanted to do is I wanted to answer a, a couple of basic questions. Um, why would we want to put a telescope in space? Why would we want to look in the infrared? Um, what are the science objectives? Because if NASA is going to spend billions of dollars on a telescope, they better have a very good reason to do it. And then finally, we'll get in and actually meet JWST and, uh, and also a little bit about MIRI, which is the instrument that I work on. Okay, so why space? So the first thing is, is that that's because it's above the atmosphere. So the atmosphere tends to blur stuff out. Um, and this is a really, this is a, a really cute picture, just looking at uh, sunshine kind of as it gets modeled looking through a swimming pool. And so you can kind of see that all the convection and turbulence in the water in the swimming pool has totally blurred the light coming down. And you can see all these patches of constructive and destructive interference. The atmosphere does the same thing to starlight and the same thing happens. And we have to, we, it's called seeing and it sort of limits, limits your resolution from, from a ground-based telescope. And this kind of, this is a good example. This is the uh, Eagle Nebula or M16. Um, and the picture on the left, the one that's all red, that's a, that's a picture taken with a 12.5 inch telescope. And any, any, astronom any amateur astronomers in the audience would know that you really can't get much better than that because once you get to a larger telescope, atmospheric seeing prevents you even getting to the diffraction limit. But the picture on the right is the same field. It's, a little, you know, it's turned to the side a little bit, but you can see the pillars, the three pillars here, and here they are here, here, and here. This is a picture that's like 25 years old now. Um, more than that. One of the first pictures from HST and, and a very famous one. Um, but you can see that the, 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 the difference in quality of the image is just extraordinary. So to be fair though, um, since that picture was taken, we've gotten a little bit better from the ground. We now use laser guide stars. There's uh, adaptive optics where you can actually take the primary mirror and you can sort of adjust it to correct for how the atmosphere is deforming an image. But that's a challenge. Um, it it, it uh, requires some special conditions. It doesn't work as well as one would like all the time. But if you launch a telescope in space, you can reach the diffraction limit of your telescope all the time. You can always be at your theoretical resolution limit. So the electromagnetic spectrum um, is what we study in astronomy and it covers the sort of a, a standard, um, you know, introductory diagram kind of showing you all the different parts of the spectrum, the visible spectrum that we see, this is a logarithmic plot, by the way. So the visible parts is a tiny little piece in the middle here. And you go, you know, to past the red, you go to infrared and onto radio. If you go in the other direction, you get ultraviolet and then x-rays. And then down here at the bottom, I've just sort of given you some ideas of, you know, as the wavelengths get shorter, the energies of the photons get higher. And, you know, you can sort of think, you know, hot things tend to radiate more at shorter wavelengths and cool things radiate at longer wavelengths. And so where you look in the electromagnetic spectrum um, kind of depends on what you want to look at because different, different types of objects show up in different parts of the spectrum. The problem though, is if you're working from the ground, the, uh, the atmosphere does a very nice job of blocking uh, most of the EM spectrum. When you think about blocking X-rays and toasty UV photons, that's probably a good thing um, because sunburns are bad enough, but getting fried as you step outside is not so good. But the, um, this plot here sort of shows you 
the, the white areas are sort of the windows. Okay, this sort of gives you an idea of how much of that light gets through. So almost all the visible light gets through. And then you move into the infrared and it gets very choppy. Um, whole chunks are missing. And those are, that's because of water vapor in the atmosphere. And there's other stuff, carbon dioxide contributes. This pesky little feature at 9.6 microns, that's from atmospheric ozone. So I guess if you go to Antarctica and you're under the ozone hole, things get better. But you can see though that if you go out to the longer wavelengths and shorter wavelengths, things are blocked completely. So this is sort of a picture that shows you how far down to the atmosphere different wavelengths go. And so everything is blocked out. Nothing reaches the surface um, you know, below ultraviolet. So there's a window in the optical, it's called the optical window very cleverly. There's another window in the radio, but that's, you know, except for little bits of infrared that aren't shown here that do get to the ground, you, you basically have to get above the water vapor. So you have to put a telescope in an airplane to get really good infrared radiation. And if you really wanna get everything, you have to launch telescopes in orbit. And so that brings us to, here's a picture. These are NASA's, this is three of their four great observatories. I don't think that's the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. It might be, but it might be another um, short wavelength telescope. So NASA decided in the, in the 80s that what they wanted to do is they wanted to launch a whole flotilla of telescopes to cover all these different wavelength ranges. The Hubble Space Telescope was one of them. That's the most famous one. Everybody knows that one, but there was actually other ones. Um, the Spitzer Space Telescope originally you know, NASA loves acronyms, right? So this is originally the, originally the shuttle infrared telescope facility. And they realized the shuttle was a bad place. So then space, and I worked on this telescope for 15 years, but everybody knows Hubble, right? Not so much Spitzer. And then Chandra over here is actually still operating. But the idea is that we, you know, these, these telescopes in orbit, looking at parts of the spectrum that we couldn't see that well before, you know, revolutionized astronomy. And so this is just an example of what you can see. Um, these are four images of, of uh, an active galaxy. This is Centaurus A. And you can see in the optical, there's this really dark dust lane across the center of the galaxy. If you move to the near infrared, that dust starts to get transparent. And now you can actually see into the heart of this galaxy. If you go to the X-ray, you can see these jets that are basically being shot out from a black hole that's right in the middle, that's like consuming all the things that fall into this galaxy. And if you look in the radio, you can see these lobes of, of, of excited gas that's heated up basically by jets like this in the past. So this multi-wavelength view is key to sort of changing how we understand things. So the Hubble Space Telescope operated in the visible part of the spectrum and a little bit into the near infrared. Spitzer operated over here in the mid infrared for the most part. And then the James Webb Space Tel Telescope is gonna cover a fair bit of the spectrum that Spitzer covered, and then a little bit of what Hubble covered and everything in between. Um, people sometimes think that Webb is the successor to Hubble. That's the idea is that Hubble is gonna continue working for a while. So Webb is really the successor to Spitzer. So the next question is why the infrared? So here's a couple of more specific questions for you. One of these two cups holds a warm beverage and the other one has a cold beverage, but you can't tell which one by looking in the optical. And then this, this fellow over here, oh, notice the Certif poster in the background. It's like before we changed the name of the telescope. He's holding up some of his fingers, but how many of them is he, is he extending out, right? You can't tell because this plastic bag is, is opaque in the optical part of the spectrum. It's also worth noting that his eyeglasses are transparent in the optical. And here we are in the infrared. So first of all, the red cup had the warm drink. So it's shining a lot more in the, inf in the infrared part of the spectrum than this cold drink is. And then over here, you can see that you can see right through the bag and here's all of his fingers. He had all five of them extended. And it's also interesting that the glass on his eyeglasses is opaque in the infrared, but you can see through it in the optical. So if you go to a different part of the wavelength, uh, part of the spectrum, um, the optical properties of things change. This is another example of that. These are two pictures of the Orion constellation. So this is an optical image over here. Here's the belt. There's Betelgeuse, which is a very red supergiant. Down here is Rigel. Here's an infrared picture of the same galaxy, same scale, taken with WISE, which is another um, space telescope. And you could see that you can't see the belt. You can't see Rigel. You could see Betelgeuse, but now it's very blue. And the only other thing that you can see is actually a bunch of nebulae. Here's the rosette over here. There's the Orion Nebula right down here. 
don't know if you guys can see, I, you can't tell me because we can interact. Um, so here's the cursor way over here. So there's, there's the Orion Nebula. The Horsehead Nebula is in here someplace. So um, Zach showed earlier a picture of uh, IRAS, and I want to show you what, what, the, what Orion looked like to IRAS, which was a true infrared telescope. So that, this picture is almost 40 years old now, and it's one of my, my favorite pictures um, because it just shows you uh, when you can start to see all the dust heated by the young stars that are forming, things look rather different and kind of amazingly cool. It turns out that Orion, the whole constellation is one giant star formation zone. Um, a similar idea um, here, this is the W5 uh, star forming region. And this is an optical image. And what I want to point out is that if you look right in here, you'll see that uh, there's this, this dark lane. And there's really not that many stars behind this lane as there are just over beside it, you know, in, in, in this upper part of the, of the image. There's all these stars. And they're kind of blotted out once you get below this, this surface. So what's blotting them out? Well, you got to look in the infrared. So this is a pretty cool picture of all the dust that's kind of been heated up. And then similarly, uh, these are two pictures uh, close up again of the of the central pillars in in the in the Eagle Nebula that I showed you earlier. These are more recent pictures taken with the newer camera in the optical, and then over here in the near infrared. And the one thing you can see is that there's all this dust kind of all through here that's kind of blocking out our view of the stars behind. And once you get once you move into the near infrared, you can see through that dust. You can see all these stars. And then I want to go back uh, to one more uh, reason to why you want to do this in space. Um, and that's because in the infrared, uh, it's all about infrared sensitivity. You, you want your telescope to be very cold because it's basically, if it's, if it's not, it's like observing with a searchlight. I mean, basically, uh, on a, in a ground-based infrared telescope, the optics are glowing in the dark. And imagine trying to work with a glow-in-the-dark telescope. We really did it. Um, and, we, and, and we still do. This is actually, this is the Wyoming Infrared Observatory. This is a telescope I cut my teeth on as a graduate student. And uh, we had to do a lot of tricks to make this work from the ground. And I'll tell you that from my own experience that observing in the summer was a lot harder because the mirror was warmer than it was in the winter. You know, when it got down to like 30 below, that was good observing weather. Um, so just to cover this, I just want to, you know, emphasize this in space, there's no atmosphere, so there's no turbulence. We can see the whole spectrum. And in space, we can make telescopes really, really cold. And then, of course, in the infrared, we can see through dust, but we can also see cool objects, including things that are made of dust, exoplanets. You can see brown dwarfs. Those are very cool, you know, sort of almost stars. And, and, and galaxies at high redshift, things that would normally be in the optical part of the spectrum are shifted into the infrared. All right. So you can see there's a lot for the James Webb Space Telescope to do. And this is sort of a list of the things with, a, with the Hubble Ultra Deep Field over here on one side, because the emphasis is on the early universe. So looking at the very first light from galaxies in the epoch of reionization, JWST can do that. Looking at the assembly of galaxies, also observing how, gal how stars are, are formed and how they're born and how planets form around them. And then finally, JWST is going to be able to um, detect exoplanets and perhaps even life. I mean, it really is possible that we will find a planet that has indications that there's life on it with this mission. So the first thing I just wanted to do is a couple slides on each of those, and then we'll get right to, James, to the James Webb Space Telescope for real. But um, the first thing is, is that it's going to be able to see much, much further into the past or to the edge of the universe than we could do before. And here's a just a nice little graph that kind of shows you when the first stars start forming and they form into galaxies, what they basically do is they, they ionize a bubble around them until eventually all of space is ionized and, and we, just, we can actually see all of these galaxies forming. And so the Hubble Space Telescope can't see to, the, to, the, to redshifts as high as, um, as Webb will be able to, like six versus 10 or 20. We don't even know exactly when the epoch of reionization is and James, James Webb will tell us. So we can also see galaxies being assembled. Um, so if you look over here on the far left, that's sort of a picture of what a galaxy would look like in today's universe. And as you go from left to right, you're going to higher and higher redshift, so further back in time. 
and the galaxies get kind of kind of splotchy and irregular and and they you can start to see that you know they're forming from mergers of other galaxies we know that this happens in the milky way because we can see the remnants of those mergers in a lot of different ways but we'll actually be able to image that in the in the past directly which is kind of amazing so here we have on the left some pictures from the hubble space telescope of disks around very young stars these are all stars that are actually ejecting material and bipolar outflows but you can see that the disk in the optical is just this opaque zone you can't see anything in it but we know that that's where the planets are forming but we can't see them in the optical this is a picture taken from the alma um, from alma which is the um in atacama on the atacama plateau in chile it's a interferometer made of a bunch of um, sub-millimeter telescopes. And I remember when we first got this picture down from, um, not down, but when, when this picture was first released, we all thought it was like a test image. This, this couldn't be real, but you can actually see here in the disk of HL Tau, all of these little dark lanes, those are cleared by the planets that are forming around this star, most likely. So that's pretty cool. So we would, we would be able to see this in the infrared, and one of the things that we can do is we could take a spectrum. This is actually sort of a PR image from a successful program that was that will be observed with the with 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 Webb once we get launched. Um, the, the the architect, the driver of this program is Melissa McClure, who I actually remember. You know, she's she's all grown up now. I remember when she was an undergraduate uh, as a summer student uh, when I was at Cornell, and and now she's leading this effort to basically. Um, take spectra so that they can study the ices and the dust grains in these disks in these young stars, which is pretty cool. Another thing that we will be able to do with Webb is we'll be able to observe exoplanets. And this is an example. This is a transiting exoplanet. And what I want to just note is that, sure, there's a transit. That's when the planet moves in front of the star. Then there's an eclipse. There's a little diagram over here in the upper right to help you out. That's when the planet moves behind the star. And you can see in between, you know, the light from the star plus planet is kind of the same. But if you look closely, if you sort of zoom in vertically on that little, little, little bit up here, you can actually see that there's a fair bit going on. Because what's happening is that as the planet gets closer to eclipse, we're seeing the hot side, the side that's always facing the star because it's coming around in its orbit and now it's facing us too. And so you can see things heat up. And so observing a lot of these transits, um, Heather Knudsen, um, who at the time was at Harvard, was able to basically make a map of what the surface of this planet looked like. And one of the things they realized was that the hot spot is not the part on the planet directly facing the star, but actually lagging. And from that, they're able to work out the wind mechanics um, you know, that, that's going on in the atmosphere of this planet orbiting another star. And that's, that's amazing in itself. And that was done with Spitzer, but we're gonna be able to do this sort of thing on a regular basis with, with Webb. Even better, because that's photometry, that's just sort of looking at you know, uh, one, one wavelength or one big chunk of wavelength at the same time, you can take spectra, which is what I do. And then you can see that when the planet moves in front of the star, you get a transmission spectrum with extra absorption from the planet, from the atmosphere of the planet. And that, if you know, in this particular case, sodium was detected, but this is how we'd be able to detect water vapor in a planet's atmosphere or ozone. These are things that would indicate that there might be life there. So there's a lot of science to be done. A lot of, uh, I think, really cool stuff is going to be happening. And it's a, you know, pretty exciting to be, to be a part of this. Um, all right, so let's meet the James Webb Space Telescopes. This is what the primary mirror looks like um, for Hubble and JWST. And you can see that uh, it's a little bit bigger, which is kind of the point. It's segmented um, so because it's, you know, it's really hard to make a mirror that big. We, we had to make the mirror so that we could actually fold it so we could fit it into a, 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 the fairing on a rocket but it's impressive. And it's all, everything is coated in gold because gold is particularly reflective in the infrared. Here's a real picture of the whole thing. The secondary mirror is all folded up in front. The primary is unfolded. Um, so this is when they were basically uh, testing the whole thing. I can't remember where this picture was taken. I should have looked that up. This might be from Houston. I like this picture because you get the NASA meatball reflection here, kind of fun. Um, this is a picture showing you what the sun shield looks like. Uh, this is actually a very critical 
an important part of the whole spacecraft. Uh, it's actually five layers. You can see them all here. Um, and uh, also pointed out that the, 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 the primary mirror here, you can see now it's folded because the, the two side pieces are folded back, which that, that's how it fits into the uh, space uh, to the rocket fairing. What the sun shield is going to do for us is it's basically going to give us a, a, a cold side that's always in the shadow of the sun shield, right? So that the sun's shining and it casts a shadow, the sun shield does. And we're going to always keep the spacecraft oriented so that the telescope itself is actually in the shade. And so the hot side is over here. The cold side can get very cold. Uh, we actually have to wait. After we launch, it's going to take like four months before we're cold enough to operate MIRI, our, teles our, our instrument, because it's the longer wavelength instrument. And the way this works is that each one of these layers will, you know, absorb a certain amount of radiation and then reflect it, you know, reflect it between the layers and out the sides. So without the sun shield, the mission won't work. So it has to unfold correctly. So the idea is that we have everything folded up. We put it in the spacecraft fairing. We plop the spacecraft fairing. Well, plop is probably not the right verb. On top of the of an Ariane five rocket in Guyana, and then we launch the whole thing. And that's going to happen. The current launch date is set to be Halloween. That's October 31st of this year. Um, so that's um, something to look very forward to. I can promise you there's a fair bit of work for us to do between now and then, but we're working on it. After launch, uh, JVST will, will deploy to a Lagrange point um, on the other side of the Earth, about a million miles past the Earth at the L2 point. And there's sort of a timeline kind of gives you the trajectory and all the things that have to happen as we go. You can see that uh, the last important thing is the secondary mirror deploys 14 days after launch. And then about 24 days after launch, we wind up here at the L2 point. And here's just some pretty pictures to kind of show you how things look. This is shortly after the, um, the, the upper stage has detached from the payload. And uh, you can see where we are down there in the bottom left in our, in our uh, launch profile. And then we keep going, the, the, the sun shield starts to deploy, to unfold. And now we're already past the moon when that happens. And then finally we get the sun shield all deployed and we will all breathe a great sigh of relief because that's a critical deployment. Um, then after that, the secondary mirror will deploy. That is also a critical deployment. If either one of those fail, it's end of mission. And then finally, the, uh, the side mirrors will uh, deploy out. It's interesting to point out that if they were not to deploy out properly and lock in the position, the mission could continue. We'd still just work with the, with the segments that we had. And then finally, here we are in the L2 point, 24 days and 17 hours after launch. So a telescope is just kind of a means to an end. Um, this is sort of like, if some, if you have a really nice camera, um, you know, you might have invested a lot of money in your telephoto lens, but in the end, the lens just gets the light onto the camera, and it's the camera that counts. So, in a nutshell, JWST has 18 primary mirror segments. It has 18 infrared detectors in the focal plane, 18 of them, and it has 18 observing modes, some, what we call them instrument modes, um, as well. And I sort of it, it, some people think the number comes out to 17, but I kind of pushed my luck and made it 18 by separating them out. And if you're curious what all these modes are, and if you happen to love acronyms, <laughs> here you go. Uh, so you can see this tells you how many detectors everybody's got. Uh, NearCam has 10 detectors. Um, you can't t tell here, but if you count them up, there's you can see eight of them. And then there's two more, which are twice, which are twice the, the, the length or height of the other ones. Um, and they're sort of superimposed in this image because they're, they're in the same place in the focal plane, just you know, pick off mirrors, kind of move the light around for them. Another point I wanna make is over here, to, this is Miri's way over here on the side. And then there's this little aperture right over here besides Miri, and that's the, uh, what's called the MRS or the moderate resolution spectrograph. And I'm gonna, I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a, in a minute or so, because that's pretty, pretty important. So as you can tell, there's an awful lot going on. Every one of these instruments has a team of people like me, maybe 20 of us, uh, directly supporting it at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And there's probably a bigger team of 30 or 40 people uh, involved in, in building it and developing it and supporting it up until the moment uh, that we're done with commissioning. 
So there's a lot of people involved just in this part of it, leaving aside you know, the people that actually built the telescope or the spacecraft. There's a huge number of people involved in this project. And everybody has to focus on their little piece. Um, and here's the, uh, the, the, the five different instruments. There's the fine guidance sensor. That's basically to make sure that we're pointed where we think we are, which is a bigger job than you might think. Near cam is the near infrared camera. It actually has a spectral mode and it can do chronography. I'll show you what that is in a sec. Near spec is the near infrared spectrometer and it basically takes spectra in all sorts of different ways from 0.6 microns, which is actually in the optical all the way out to five. And then nearest is a, another instrument that can do both imaging and slitless. And then finally, MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument, which is the one I work on, is the only instrument that does anything beyond five microns. And it goes all the way out to 28, imaging, spectroscopy, and coronography. And then for fun, we have all their happy little uh, logos. FGS and nearest, they actually share one, I guess, because I think they're actually built on the same platform. All right, here's MIRI from the outside. Um, what I'm going to do is just, I'm not going to focus on all the instruments, but just Miri, because we don't have a day and a half to, to talk about this. And mostly because I, you know, this is the point where I would look out in the audience. I can't see anyone. I look out to see if, if, if people are still awake, if they're interested. Um, so I'm just going to have to assume that nobody's nodding off yet. Um, but I promise you, we're only going to do Miri. So this is what it looks like from the outside. This is a big instrument. It's like over three and a half, four feet across from side to side. It's big because it does a lot. Here we are on the inside. This is just the imaging detector. Um, this actually takes care of all of the modes except for the MRS. There's a big imaging field, and here's a here's a nice little you know simulation of, of what it would be able to see with some galaxies and stars thrown in. <clears throat> um, here's the chronographs. You can see that what the way these work is that you block the light from the central star. So what you'll do is you move this to a star and you'll block the light from the star so you can see if there's any planets orbiting it or maybe a debris disk or something like that. So that's, um, and then there's also a, a spectrometer. Uh, there's this little slit right here and then a prism will, will spread the light out and make a spectrum right here. The uh, MRS <clears throat> or the medium or moderate resolution spectrometer is a pretty amazing um, instrument. Well, it's, it's, I think it's almost an instrument in its own right, but it's a pretty interesting part of, of, of MIRI. So what happens is, is that it takes a, an image, but the image is sliced up into the equivalent of little slits. And each one of these slits is then placed so that you disperse the light from it into a spectrum. And what happens now is that you're actually simultaneously taking a spectrum and an image at the same time. So you're taking basically a three-dimensional image where the third dimension is wavelength. So that's called a data cube or a spectral data cube. And this is kind of how the way this thing works. And if you don't understand, you know, if this is like too technically intensive, I can promise it took me a little while to actually figure this all out as I was reading through the, through the manuals. But the, the idea is that there's these different, we have four different channels and each one has a parallel set of optics and, and, and they go into shorter to longer wavelengths. So blue is the shortest. And there's these four apertures for each one. The light is sliced and then spread into all of these spectra, just like you see here. And then those will be assembled. We have a lot of software that we've written that will assemble those back into data cubes. And they, or, but if you look at it, it's, it's because the apertures get bigger with wavelength. It's kind of a data pyramid, really. But the point though, is that you assemble one of these things, you actually have 12,000 discrete images, each at its own wavelength. You know? So it's, it's, it's a, an incredible amount of information um, that you can obtain by just pointing this thing in one direction. And you can imagine with all of these different instrument modes, uh, we have to have a lot of, uh, a lot of people work out. So here's our team. This is, this is just the team at the Space Telescope Science Institute. That's, that's me right there, third from the left on the second row, in case you were wondering. I guess you see my picture here, so you know what I look like. And then David Law, the person that did the stained glass uh, stuff I showed you at the beginning, Nora designed it, and then he actually made the stained glass. This is him right here on the far right side of the top row. And he's actually the person at Space, at Space Telescope in charge of the MRS. And you know that's a very complicated mode. So you know that, um, that David could probably, he could probably beat me at chess. I haven't tried, but I'm pretty sure that would happen. Um, and I should also point out that the instrument development team, the people that built this, um, are scattered all through Europe. Um, there's a big group in Paris, a big group in Heidelberg, 
a big group in Edinburgh and Scotland. And there's, there's, I'm leaving people out in, in Leuven and then also in, in Ireland. And then also there's groups associated with this in the US in Arizona and California, plus us in Maryland. So a lot of people all over the world have gone into making this possible. And I am very proud and privileged to be a part of that. So you gotta get ready for launch because it's coming. This is the part where I have uh, decided not to put any um, puns based on the, the name of the telescope, but I'll let you do that for me. All right, that's uh, that's pretty much all I had for a presentation. How much? How did I do on time? Not too bad. Finished a little early. Still there, Zach? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah, we got time for questions from the sound of it. See if we if we uh, if anybody is still with us. Here's a few possible questions to ask if you didn't think of any of your own. Well, we but, have a question uh, uh, okay. already from uh, Josh. He asks, uh, what has been the biggest logistical or engineering challenge in getting JWST ready for launch finally? Whoa. Uh, I, well, there's two of them. I, I would say one of them is uh, just the technology behind Every one of those those 18 mirror segments has all these actuators on the other side, and then those will actually be used to drive the the the, the different segments so that they're all aligned properly. And so the the technology behind building that, and then the technology behind actually making sure that we have all of those mirrors pointed in the right place continuously through the mission. That's that's quite a challenge. So the telescopes group at uh, at Space Telescope is a very impressive group of people. And I have a lot of faith in them. They'll, they'll, they'll do this because they've got to, <laughs> that's one. And I think actually the, the sun shields are also proving to be quite a challenge. Um, they're, they're, it's a little scary. Uh, this is, what happens is when you're, when, you, when you're kind of on the inside of a mission, you start to find out all the things that, you know, the greater world doesn't, doesn't know about. And it's always a little unsettling, but in the end things work, you know? So in the end, anyway. Thanks awesome. for that question. We got a follow-up question from Josh. Uh, he said, is JWST the first collaboration between the different continental space agencies like ESA and NASA and so forth? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you had mentioned, Zach, you had mentioned IRAS earlier. IRAS mm -hmm. was, a, was a joint effort. I, I can't remember. That was, that was 40 years ago. I can't remember when ESA came into being. It might have been early in ESA, or it might have been before then, but the Dutch were very heavily involved, and the British were very heavily involved in the development of IRAS. That was a joint effort. So this has happened before, and there's a lot of give and take now on, on, on most space missions. Usually, the Europeans will lead it, and we'll have a small part, or vice versa. But in the case of JWST, this is a very much a joint international effort, although I would point out that uh, I think that the American taxpayer is footing a larger chunk of the bill than anyone else. Very cool. I, I wanted to ask, um, maybe we're waiting to see if uh, we get some more questions come in, but um, I wanted to ask about uh, the timeline and specifically, I wanted to ask how long before the launch date, you know, did JWSC start in terms of when was it first conceptualized? How long since then, the first steps, all that? Let's see. Um, Early 90s, I remember mid, I'll say mid 90s. I remember uh, when Dan Golden, who was the NASA administrator at the time, they were discussing what the successor of HST would look like. And uh, that came out. And so then it was sort of the late 90s when um, the, the current design started to get laid out. So it's, it's been over 20 years, which is not an, untyp not an atypical timeline. Um, this one's been a little long because there's been, there have been some delays because of the technological challenges. Um, and, you know, the, the whole fact that it's a deployable primary, Josh, I should have mentioned that too, actually, that the, you actually have to unfold the telescope. Um, it is my understanding that this has been done before, but uh, these were classified missions. So I don't know if that's really true or not, but, but yeah, that's a, that's a challenge. Very cool. So this was already being conceptualized, you know, in the time where even Hubble was in its prime. Oh know. yeah, it's yeah. Very cool. I mean, as we speak now, uh, there's 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 multiple ideas floating around for what 
the next space telescope might look like. And of course, the Space Telescope Science Institute is already involved in um, in in what used. I'm just trying to oh, I'm drawing it. Yeah, you know, so they're, they're, we're basically always trying to think a mission ahead is the best way to put it. Sounds good. You think you could answer uh, one of these questions on your slides, and you could pick your most. Whatever oh, I, you think is your favorite? I think, well, the first question is, uh, could NASA even function without acronyms? And I think everybody knows the answer to that question. The answer is no, of course not. And then the question is, what is the official NASA acronym for acronym? And I remember I was actually working at, uh, at, a, at a NASA facility in um, California, um, Ames Research Center, which is uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I went in and I asked uh, our, our branch uh, administrator this question and her eyes just lit up and she pulled out this, uh, this old line printer, um, you know, those, those big 11 by 17 inch pages that they're like accordion folded line printer things. And she pulled out this big line printer collection of all the NASA official acronyms and just handed it to me. And I, well, that doesn't help me. There's a lot of acronyms here. She says, you need to look up TLA, which is three letter acronym. And that would be the official acronym. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Let's see. Well, I, we could go. Um, I talked about Miri, but I should say something, especially since Nora's stained glass design is in the talk. We got to say something about NIRSPEC. Uh, so NIRSPEC has inside it what's called the micro shutter assembly. This is a pretty neat idea. So the way this works is that it consists of 250,000 shutters they're all magnetically actuated. So what you do is you set the charge on each, each shutter and then you pass a magnet over to open them and then to close them and then back over to close the ones that are supposed to be closed. And now what you have is you've got this, this, this array with all these open shutters. So you can take a spectrum in each location. So if you wanna take a spectrum of, you know, say, you know, a couple hundred stars in a nearby galaxy that all belong to some cluster, well, you can do that with this, with this thing. Um, that's pretty advanced technology. Um, and it's going to be, you know, there's, there's all, everything comes with its challenges. So we'll see, but that's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. And, and uh, we just completed, how hard is it to get observing time? Well, we just completed that process uh, a month ago. We all found out the results. So basically the way it works to get telescope time at any facility is you have to write a, an observing proposal. And people always talk about the oversubscription rate, which is basically how many proposals uh, are, are, are submitted for everyone accepted. And for JDBST, the oversubscription rate is four to one. So for every four proposals submitted, only one gets accepted. And that's not great odds. Um, I managed to get one proposal that, that I was, I was uh, doing and that I, that I actually had written as a, as a principal investigator. And that's to use the MRS. You can see that I'm all excited about it. For our audience, could you think you could provide some context for that? Maybe compared to other telescopes, what, you know, four to one, is that pretty normal? Is it pretty high? Four, well, it's, I actually thought, you know, I, it's certainly a challenge to get time when, when it's that high, but, but it, 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 I think that it will be higher in cycle two significantly. Um, uh, the HST just just completed an observing proposal cycle, and their subscription rate is eight to one. <laughs> you know, but you know, HST it's it's an interesting thing because uh, Web gives us uh, so much more that we can do, but it's a very complicated telescope. And I think what happens is, is that astronomers haven't quite figured out yet how to how to get wrapped around it and use it. And I think that will come. And I think that once they also see everything working, that we'll get a lot more proposals the next go around. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, I don't think we have any more questions uh, from our audience from what I'm seeing in the chat. So um, I think we can go ahead and call it for the night unless you have any final thoughts for everyone. No, I think uh, I think we're good. I thank right. everybody for, uh, for uh, checking it out. And uh, I'm looking forward to when we can do this in person again. Yeah, us too. And thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is, a, like I said, this is our last event for the spring. Um, so we'll see you again in the fall. Um, and in the meantime, feel free to go back and check on if you missed one of our other events. All of our events this year are now recorded on YouTube. So you can check those out. 
And if you're all caught up to date and you still haven't got enough, you can check out our playlist where we've compiled videos from other Astronomy on Tap locations throughout the world. So check that out. Have a great summer. We'll see you later.